it's Miss Stewart, and today we're actually going to be covering two sets of topics from Unit 1, um, and we're going to be doing 1.9, which is trophic levels, and 1.10, which is the 10% rule. And honestly, I think these basically go hand in hand, so it's easier to just teach them together, so that's why we'll be covering both of these topics at once today. Now, that means that we have a couple different sets of learning objectives. So the first set is going to be explain how energy flows and matter cycles through trophic levels. You're going to learn about ecosystems and the flow of energy in those ecosystems. You're going to learn how biogeochemical processes are essential for this life. And we're going to talk about terrestrial and marine communities with how energy flows in those. And the skill that you're going to practice is explain environmental concepts and processes. And then the learning objective for the second set of topics is going to be determine how the energy decreases as it flows through ecosystems. So the essential knowledge that you're getting for that is the 10% rule and the loss of energy as it goes through trophic levels. And the skill that you will practice at the end of this is going to be a mathematical one where you will calculate an accurate numeric answer with appropriate units. So to start out, we're going to go and revisit some of the laws of thermodynamics, which maybe it's been a little while since you've heard of those. But the gist of it is, is the idea that matter and energy are never created or destroyed. They can only change forms. They don't just appear out of nowhere. Now, an example of this would be if a tree dies, dies then you have the carbon, nitrogen, water, and phosphorus are then returned to the soil and the atmosphere. They don't just disappear when the tree dies. They don't multiply. Um, you have this cycling, like what we talked about with the biogeochemical cycles. Now, that would be a movement of matter. An example of energy is going to be where you have the sun's rays, which is light energy, which is going to hit a leaf. Then it's going to be converted into glucose. And glucose is a form of chemical energy. You have energy stored in the bonds of that glucose molecule. And this is in line with the first law of thermodynamics, which basically again says that energy is never created or destroyed. So we see that the biogeochemical cycles, which we recently talked about with the carbon cycle, the nitrogen cycle, the water cycle, and the phosphorus cycle, these are going to demonstrate to us the conservation of matter, like I talked about with the example of a tree dying. And food webs are going to demonstrate conservation of energy, which we will be covering food webs in the next set of notes for 1.11. But an example of a food web is going to be if you have a rabbit eat a leaf, the energy from that leaf, which the energy was in glucose, is then transferred to the rabbit, and then the rabbit stores that in its fat or its muscle. So you went from sunlight to the leaf in the form of glucose to the rabbit, and that's going to be the conservation of energy through that food web. Now we have the second law of thermodynamics, and this is basically going to get to us to the idea that every time energy is transferred, some of it is going to be lost as heat. So if you <clears throat> envision fossil fuel combustion, that's going to be a warm process. Think about your car engine. It gets hot because combustion is happening. So heat is going to be where you lose some energy, and but some of that will be able to be processed on. So if we're burning fossil fuels to create electricity for our homes, a lot of it will be lost in heat, but 35% of it might go to the power lines here. And then you'll lose some of it again, and then a good chunk of it will go to this light bulb. And if you think of the whole process, you end up losing 95% of that heat and only 5% goes to light. So if you go and you multiply those, that means that the efficiency of this whole process is only 1.6%, which unfortunately is kind of a common theme when it comes to a lot of our human processes for combustion of fossil fuels and energy usage. We will cover that all later this year. 
But with this law of thermodynamics, we can then go and apply it to food webs. And the way that this applies is that the amount of usable energy decreases as you move up the food chain. So um, organisms will use it in the form of heat. Think about yourself, just your body does a lot to maintain that 98.6 degrees. When you're moving, it releases heat through your cellular respiration. When you are breathing, you might notice that it's warm. There's heat. If someone put a heat map over you, you would be radiating because through cellular respiration that all of your cells are doing, you are releasing heat. If you are running and exercising, you're losing even more heat. And so you are losing this energy in the form of heat, which means as you move up the food chain, if a bear were to eat you, you ended up losing a lot of that energy in heat, which means there's less for the bear to get. So if you look at this example, if we start with the sun coming into the plant and what's available to it, the plant does cellular respiration. So it's gonna lose heat to the environment. So then the moose is gonna have less. The moose is gonna do cellular respiration. It's gonna lose energy in the form of heat to the environment. So when the lion goes to eat it, there's gonna be way less. So when you think about what we started with the sun through this whole process, it's decreasing. So that by the time we get to these lions, there is not that much usable energy left for them. Now, because available energy decreases with each step up the food chain, um, you have a trophic pyramid. And trophic just means nourishment or growth. And we use this trophic pyramid to kind of model how energy moves through an ecosystem. So this is what a trophic pyramid looks like. It's also called an energy pyramid sometimes. It, it's kind of like basically the same thing. Um, the trophic's kind of focusing on the organisms, the energy is focusing on the energy, but essentially it all shows us the same thing. So if you've got these producers on the bottom, you've got your plants and you've got your primary consumers, they're the ones that eat the producers. The ones that eat them are secondary consumers, the ones that eat them are tertiary. So as we move up here, we can also use it to see how energy moves through an ecosystem. And remember, we've got this 10% rule basically is the number that ends up coming out, which means that in these pyramids, only about 10% of the energy from one level can make it to the next level. And the other 90% is used by the organism and is lost as heat. So if we look at the plants, they are going through cellular respiration, they're losing heat. We're going to lose 90% of it. So only 10% of that is available to bunnies. Now they're going to do that too. So 90% is gone, only 10% of that is available to the snakes. The snakes do cellular respiration and lose it, which means only 10% is gonna be available for the tertiary consumer. Now, one thing to say, the 10% rule, it's an average. There are some pyramids where it might be more efficient, some pyramids where it might be less efficient. So um, if you were to do an experiment on this, you might not always get exactly 10%, but generally it's an average. And that's going to be the general rule that we go with of how much is going to be available at the next level. Now, um, when it comes to trophic levels, we also have biomass as part of this that we can look at. So when we have the different names for each of the levels, um, you're going to want to know each step of this pyramid. So on the bottom here, these are the producers their plants. They produce, we call them producers because they basically take sun's light and then they produce it into a usable form, which is glucose. Now, remember when I say produce, it's not like it's coming out of nowhere because matter cannot be created or destroyed. So they're getting some of the, the carbon from the carbon cycle, the nitrogen, they're getting all of those and they are creating glucose from the light's energy. And those are the producers, the plants at the bottom there. Then we have the primary consumers. These are the animals that eat the plants. They are herbivores, such as some birds and mice or deer. Then we have secondary consumers. These are the animals that eat the primary consumers. Um, so they eat the herbivores. So they are usually either carnivores or they can be omnivores. So you could have like a raccoon that will eat birds and bugs, but will also go and eat plants. Um, 
but it could also be like a fox that just eats meat. So it is a carnivore, but they eat the herbivores. And then you have the tertiary consumers. These ones eat the secondary consumers. Um, and they basically end up being kind of like the top predators or the apex predators when you look at this. So when you are talking about who eats who, we've got the 10% rule for energy, but this also applies to biomass. And biomass is basically the mass of all living things at each trophic level. So if you look at this, it's decreasing as it goes up the pyramid. So down here, we have way more biomass from these plants. You go up the next one, there's less biomass for the herbivores. You go to the secondary consumers, there's less biomass for them. You go to the tertiary, there is less biomass at each. So if you take the mass of all of them, there's less at each level because that 10% rule, remember, there is only 10% available to the next level there. And this is because energy is needed for growth. So only about 10% of energy transfers from one level to the next. So only about 10% of the biomass can be grown or supported. Now, if we were to go and look at the numbers of this, that's usually how biomass is. So let's say we have a thousand kilograms of plants. If we've got the 10% rule, the next one would be a hundred kilograms. And the next one would be 10 kilograms, which means up at the bears with the tertiary consumers, we are left with one kilogram of biomass. Now I'm gonna show you how it is that we calculate biomass and energy, because remember it's the 10% rule for both of them. So in order to calculate biomass, you are going to divide by 10. Now, the easy way to do that is to just move the decimal place one spot to the left. So as we are moving up, you're gonna divide by 10. So if we start with 95,000 joules, joules is a unit of energy at the bottom here. Then to go up to the primary consumers, we would divide by 10, which means we would move that decimal spot one place to the left, which then leaves us for the primary consumers right here, they have 9,500 joules. If we go to the secondary consumers, you move that decimal spot again, so we're left with 950. And then the final one, you're gonna be left with 95 joules. So that was the 10% looking at energy there. Now this is gonna be an opportunity for you to calculate biomass energy. So let's say you were to be given only, you don't start at the bottom. You're given the secondary consumers, they have 80 kilograms of biomass. I want you to take a moment and to practice calculating the biomass that would be available at each level. So we are going to check our answers for that. And remember, you would divide by 10 to get here. So in order to move backwards, you would multiply by 10 and then multiply by 10 again. So hopefully those are the answers that you got when you were calculating it. Now you're gonna have a chance to do a little bit more practice with your FRQs. Um, and the first one is going to be, I want you to explain why a relatively large forest can only support a small number of wolves. And then I want you to do a little bit more practice with this calculation here. And I want you to calculate the amount of energy available to a tertiary consumer in the following ecosystem. So if there is 100,000 joules of energy produced by plants in the ecosystem. So if we're looking at our pyramid here, on the bottom would be 100,000 joules. I want you to calculate. Remember when you calculate, you need to give me your units and you need to show me your step-by-step -step calculation. If you just give me the final answer, I will not count that because College Board will not count that on the test. So I want you to practice with showing your units um, and showing the step-by-step -step process of how you got your math. So those are going to be your practice problems for 1.9 and 1.10. And those were your notes on trophic levels and the 10% rule.